Don't do that. After dark and we're back trying to figure out what city Tiffany is in. Um, <laughs> we not thrown off the show in an undisclosed location. Uh, we got Orange the Morganite, uh, Line Brother Katie, Frat Brother Eric. Whoa. A uh, lot of stuff to get to tonight, so we got to kind of speed through the agenda. First, let's talk about the election. Um, it goes without saying what the headline is for us. Uh, Howard University alumna Kamala Harris. Senator Kamala Harris is the vice president elect of the United States on the uh, ticket with former Vice President Joe Biden. Trump has yet to accept defeat. Um, we have talked in the past about what the policies may be for HBCUs, but we can I think we can take a moment and just kind of um, live in the moment. What is it like to have an HBCU alumna um, to, to get that high in government and, and not only just in government, but in, in power throughout the world? Obviously, we have to defer to Tiffany's nonsense. Um, first, you literally have 90 seconds. First of all, it doesn't matter to me um, <laughs> that y'all's president has not conceded because you can't see the wind, but you can feel it. It is what it is. My good sis, my commencement speaker is the Madam Vice President elect. It's lit. I already booked everything, claim my PTO. I will be there, mask on, hand sanitizer on deck with my people. That's it. Oh, and we were never quiet. Let's be clear. Yeah, that's right. Right. We're not. <laughs> we don't do that. We were how, never could, how conceited do you think that Howard's going to oh, be? Oh no, I told you, I told you like when it happened. I said, How are you about to be like the presidential? <laughs> how are you old news now? If I use my real eyes like I used to before these, I would be. But no, you're right. Stairs in Presidential Howard University. <laughs> <laughs> how do y'all feel about it? As people who didn't graduate from Howard, how do y'all feel about it? Equally excited, but for different reasons. <laughs> Why, the, I mean, what's the HBCU alone in you say about this? It, it says to me that we don't necessarily have to measure ourselves up against PWIs to be successful. And it's really proven the point that PWIs do not prepare the black students in the way that HBCUs do for the world at large. As you can see, now a PWI woman, black woman made it to that level. It took a woman from an HBCU to do so. And I'm not saying to the, I don't want to diminish anybody's education because education is important across the board, but this speaks to not just Kamala becoming Madam Vice President, but the work that Stacey Abrams did and the, yep. work, that, and the work that Keisha Lance Bottom did to make sure that we flipped Georgia that was three women from three different HBCUs on one mission. It, it just goes to show you that we are as prepared as our PWI counterparts, if not more so, for the fights that we take on in this country. And so that's the this encouraging part. Average, this to me was about average degrees. Joe Biden went to the University of Delaware. I got into UD. This is the Every first time degree. in my lifetime. <laughs> This is my yeah. first time. This, this is the first time in my lifetime where a president hasn't gone to an Ivy League school. That's a Rhodes Scholar. Didn't go to some top 15 law school. He went to the University of Delaware. That man is a blue hen. Man, what? He didn't even, he went to an FCS University of Delaware in Newark, Delaware. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's a big I think there's a lot of talks about how like these are the two most relatable candidates. Um, that the country's had in a long time in terms of not coming from a lot of money, not going to elite schools. Um, Hastings is a really good law school, though. I will say that, though. I mean, Hastings is a better law school than Syracuse. But, um, I mean, but both, again, uh, kind of went their own path and are still successful. I think in general, though, I want to see what she's able to do as VP because, again, people call VP like where political careers go to die. Because a lot of VPs don't get elected. The last one to get elected, well, besides Biden, and he didn't get elected immediately after. He wouldn't um, run, though. Was, he would have won if he'd ran immediately after Obama. Uh, that's debatable. But um, but the last one to do it fresh out was Bush, and he was a one-term HW, president. right? Yeah. Yeah, HW. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he, and then, then he got swept by, by Clinton. So I think that it'll be interesting to see. But again, this is a win for people who go to average, you know, non-elite school i mean i don't get average in a derogatory term but like a these are places where you don't have to have a silver spoon or perfect t score to go to and you still can become 
um, you still can hold the highest political office in the land. I think that says something to people who may think that they can't achieve things unless they go to those type of places. And it creates a certain level of anxiety about if I don't go to Harvard, then I'll never be be president. Hmm. Fred? I mean, it's a lot to like process low key because in my head, like I got the, I got the, I'm excited from a representative politics side. Mm-hmm. And then I have to immediately go to, all right, I need work done. I'm like, I could be happy all I want that she's there. And it's great that she's there. It's like first woman, period. And then you got to like list off the like extra blackity black superlatives. <laughs> right. And so that you got to start there. But then I'm like, all right, we need work done immediately. Right. Like there's certain people that I need in the rooms. I got some people that you can call up. Uh, uh, one of them is like talking to you right now. I have no problem like me and my people talk about it. But what I'm saying is, is in the long run, we as people can be excited, but we cannot be content. And I think that's the part where people are, oh, you come across like a hater. It's like, oh, no, nah, like you just she, she's in a probationary period. <laughs> like the next yeah, she knows, years. Because I think that more than was the case with Obama who was pretty insulated from a lot of black criticism until he was about to leave and gone. Until you heard black folks, even in, in on Capitol Hill, starting to say, yeah, man, we didn't get some things done. Do you yeah. think that, I think that she will be more protected by that? Because I think that, that Tavis, they're going to- uh, Hold up, hold up. No. Hold up. No. First hundred days, they've already, they've already said, Student loan forgiveness, first hundred days, top priority for Biden. And if it don't happen, then what? Who gonna criticize? Oh, Howard? Okay. HBCU? <laughs> Who gonna yeah. criticize? No, I'm gonna hear this. Who do y'all think is gonna criticize her? I mean, have you not been seeing criti- criticism? Who's gonna criticize her? Let's be serious. Like, 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 oh, wait a minute. A whole, whole, bunch, bunch, a whole bunch, bunch of black women hating black men. That's right. Come on. Yeah, true. Exactly. Let me let me say this. It. it was one thing when black folks were criticizing her as a presidential candidate. Now, James Clyburn cleared that up really fast. He was like, it's one thing for you to think Kamala can't beat Trump. OK, so we had a lot of criticism in that opening cauldron of who we're going to get to be the Democratic representative. That was that's separate and apart. Hmm. All the you know American descendants of slaves and Kamala's record in Oakland oh, and other stuff. That's out the door. She's not the she's not the president. She's the vice president. So realistically, how much one, how much blame can you assign to her for policies that don't get done? It's either the president or Congress. You're asking a question that's that's uh, grounded in logic. And these niggas. (laughs) <laughs> yo, yo, the they girls, don't have listen, it. Listen, the girls of Nick, the girls well, of Nick. I mean, all right, but to Tiffany's point and to Tiffany's point, because that's fair. That is a fair point. Um, but, uh, what is his name? Donald John Trump got like more black votes this time than he did the last time. Facts. So <laughs> it is incredibly for a minute. A very small population in the black community. It is a very tall hill. But black women charged uh, charged the whole entire electorate up and got him over the hump and got them over the hump rather. So, you know, it's okay. We just got to stop. And that's the other thing. We just got to stop reading what's on the internet. Because a lot of it is bad information. A lot of it just is not true. And so, like, the sentiment of the community isn't necessarily what you read on the internet. Because our vote, our vote, proved that. Right. If you listen to us on the internet, you would, Biden was dead in the water. Correct. It wasn't to them black votes in Until Milwaukee, black Philadelphia, right. Atlanta <laughs> came in. Detroit. And that's when you found out, yeah, Detroit, sorry. Shout out Detroit, because they started. Milwaukee. They, <laughs> Detroit, Detroit did start the party. Right. Um, but it wasn't until those votes came in that you realized, ah, the internet doesn't vote, which I've been saying this entire summer. The internet doesn't vote. <laughs> so stop reading with everything that you see because it's not all true. Now the internet did get this thing incredibly wrong in terms of how he would be him. It wasn't the overwhelming repudiation that we thought it would be, but for the most part, we showed up, we showed out, and it was on the heels of 
Joe Biden, who was extremely popular in the black community. Remember, he won the black South by a lot. And Kamala Harris, who was extremely likable besides her uh, her record as a prosecutor. She checks all of the boxes except that one. I we mean, got 90 There's no perfect left. candidate. We got 90 seconds left in this segment. I just want y'all to tell me who in the HBCU community, student, alumni, institution, or I graduate got is going the to trash same, her for something that, that, same, that, that we don't like. The, the same, same people who talk about how HBCUs are anti-Black. All about to say it's one person. That, I don't say that. listening to them. Hey, Nobody hey, listening to, no, listen to them. And they yeah, do have a point. Your they do have a point. Who? Oh, there was there, there, there was a, there was another Howard University person who was really close to the top on the Trump campaign. That was like was act like like he might be the first one to say it. So like let's oh. not act like <laughs> like my girlfriend just said. Let's not act like let's not act like HBCUs don't also breed black conservatives and black Republicans. First of all, don't talk about our brother that way. Second of all, <laughs> they already started. I, I, I follow a bunch of fam you dudes, all dudes. Most of them are actually from a certain fraternity, not y'all's, but <laughs> who are all mad conservative. They all come Florida. off Florida. Of they all are like, you know, Team DeSantis, you know, no mask. And these and these dudes That's the they, they, lived, they lived on the same floor as I did in Gibbs. Like and they from Miami, from Tampa, from Fort Myers, from the hood. And they are like DeSantis, Team wow. Trump. I'm, okay. This is gonna be interesting. It's it's good vibes now, and it'll probably be good vibes for a year or two. Mm-hmm. It depends. Uh, it depends. It wholly depends. Because of her it, wholly de- it wholly depends on what happens in Georgia. That's a lot of it right there. If we get the Senate, then we'll see what they actually that, do. That, now that's a point. If, depending on how the houses shift, that mm-hmm. that criticism or that insulation will be different. Because right now we can hold Rich McCardle accountable. Also, we'll our next subject. Uh a study that came out of Ohio State University that suggests that HBCU graduates are healthier than black students who graduate from non-HBCUs. That just after dark, we'll be right back. Bad note. That just after dark, and we're back. We want Kamala to bring broadband to Detroit. Um, we're Damn. waiting for Winston getting them into school to rejoin us. Um, let's go to our next topic, uh, and that is a recent study out of Ohio State University that suggests that graduates from historically black colleges and universities or black African-American graduates of HBCUs have better outcomes than black graduates of predominantly white institutions. Now, you have to look at the study closely to, to I guess, get some of the some of the connection, um, because it's not saying that that black folks are healthier from black colleges. It's saying that the people they survey report that they've not had a lot of the factors that lead to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, stuff like that. I'm actually going to be talking to the researcher uh, tomorrow. Um, we're going to be interviewing her for the digest to try to get some of these correlations because you know I, i'm in no okay. way am, am i a researcher or a scientist it's just i don't get it how where you go to school would impact how healthy you how are do you isolate are you, are you serious i, no, I mean no. let, me, let me say I, this i, I, I am guessing idea. i don't know i'm i can guess that okay if you don't have to deal with as much stress from racism from social ostracization uh, ostracizing, I should say, that those lay good foundations for you to feel good about yourself, to self-assess in a different way, and therefore you say, "I don't have, I don't have heart problems. I don't have, I don't, I haven't had a stroke. I don't have diabetes." It is possible uh, that you could say that that we are more health inclined at HBCUs because everybody knows the more educated you are, the better health outcomes you are likely to have. So, you know, it's easy to guess, but I don't I don't readily know, like, OK, if you drink more water, you'll have clear skin. It doesn't seem that that easy to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but like, how do you isolate what would be four to six years of somebody's life as being the thing that most impacts whether they will meet? high blood pressure, heart disease or diabetes or whatever the case. And we're all black and still living in America. Like, I, I don't get it. Eric, you, you, you have some, some, some I, thoughts on it. I get, I completely understand this. You're just talking about this from racism. I'm talking like the impact of mental anguish and stress on your body during what for many people 
is a very formative period of life where they're trying to find themselves. So we're sitting here talking about things like imposter syndrome. We're talking about not like not even just like actual racism, but perceived racism. Like this doesn't feel right. It's talking about the like the mental gymnastics that people do over the span of four to six years to socialize, to get in contact with connections, knowing that they're black, to consistently asking, am I getting this because I'm good enough or is that they picking me because I'm the diversity higher? All these things really can take place over this four period of four years in a place that's really a social experiment in itself because no other part of your lifetime is going to look like college. So if you take all of that in and you say for four years of your life, who you are was being seen and not only that, but supported and not only that celebrated, you get a sense of self, like a, like a true sense of self. You get an education from someone who looks like you because you know you can do the things you're going to school to do. If you take four years of that encapsulated mental anguish and stress off of your body, it makes perfect sense to me why going to an HBC will make you healthier. I could I could see that. I could I see the, the mental edge of that. Uh, obviously, that's what I think we all can agree, like, being self-affirmed takes stress off your body. And I think that we would all agree that stress is the key part of this. But at the same time, even, even with all that being considered, that you're less stressed from a social, uh, a, a, a social construct and racial aspect. You still drinking and drugging in college? You still, you, you still not sleeping more. well. You still not, you know. still, you still engaging in probably the most unhealthiest behavior of your lifetime in that four to six years that you'll be there. So if all things are considered, are we are we just bionic to that stuff? Or what? No, but I think your mind has more of an impact on you than people give credit. I, I got okay. one more. I'll buy that. Hey, like, say something? Well, yeah, I think, so this is, we're talking post-graduation, um, right, that we're healthy after we graduate? Correct, actually. So the other thing is that um, HBU, HBCU students, again, or alumni, rather are doing better um economically than our pwi counterparts going back mm -hmm. to that so if healthcare is tied to employment in america okay and we're more gainfully employed odds are that we're doing better um from a health standpoint because we have access to health care maybe our pwi counterparts don't and that might be the only thing because i'm curious to see what the study shows too because i think there's just a lot of gray like you can't take a thousand students and say well, a thousand and i say that this is the truth it just I don't I don't and actually on the stats like like so what is the research is a survey right and they mm -hmm. said how is your health now and the HBCU students surveyed in talking about I'm doing pretty well at about 31 percent and the mm -hmm. black students that were from PWIs came in at about 23 hmm. percent so you're talking about a, a relatively sizable gap in terms of one group of people are saying they're doing good and another people are, a group of people with similar factors are saying I'm not doing as well as I want to be. Tiffany, you gonna say something? Yeah, I I want to know how the survey respondents identified in terms of their gender gender identity and their sexual orientation because we know that our schools are black and conservative AF, and so we also know that our HBCU students who are of the LGBTQIA community they don't necessarily have the most positive experiences on our campus, especially if they express their identity and their orientation outside of what the majority think is, is an acceptable way to express those things. So I do have a concern over that piece because that really forms how HBCU students will have an experience on our campus. And that's one of the things that um, like I referenced in the previous segment of um, the same people that are going to hold uh, the Honorable Kamala D. Harris accountable are those who are on the TL saying that, you know, HBCUs are anti-Black and this is how. And so, like, I, I have concerns over who did you ask? Where's Laura? I'm you ask Royal Court, if you ask SGA, yeah, they're going to tell you they're good. Oh God! But the numbers, but, 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 but Tiffany, the numbers are still low. Like the numbers are low. Like you said, thirty-one percent versus twenty-three. So it's not like it's not saying it's not saying that black people are doing no. great. It's saying that, that two people are reporting that they're doing yeah. right. 
And, and that's still a very low number. It so they're saying 69% of the students aren't doing that. the background of the people. That's not I mean, necessarily. That's, that's, no, no, but, but, no. But Tiffany, my point is that we're, we're, we're talking about 31% saying I'm good versus 69 saying I'm bad versus 23 69%. saying I'm. So if you, if, you, if you look at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. it's not saying that HBCU students are doing great overall. It's saying in comparison to PWI students. So it's, this is like, this is why I always say mm -hmm. like, this is. This is like saying that, that that PG County is the richest black county, but in comparison to the rest of the DC metro area, it's the poorest. <laughs> so it's like, again, when you look at things, when you compare like black students versus black students, HBCU students do better. When you compare black students from all schools to white students, we're still not doing as well. So it's not saying that HBCUs create some false sense of reality or that we're, we're perfect. It's just saying that we're a little bit better in this messed up place called America. And it's saying like PG County, where PG County is better than Baltimore City, it's better than any city of Detroit, it's better than New York, it's better than Houston. But yeah, we, why, why we got so much smoke for Detroit tonight? But, <laughs> I don't know. Fairfax, Montgomery no, County, no. Howard County, Baltimore County, the rest of the state, PG County is the worst performing part of the part of the part of the uh, DC area. And it's worth second more performing in, in, in the state of Maryland behind only Baltimore City. So <laughs> watch your mouth, boy. <laughs> I'm just talking about stats. When, so let me, yeah. let me ask this, because Winston is critical to this. So I'm I'm not casting a judgment either way. Winston, you have PWI experience and you also have experience sending students to HBCU. So where do you stand on the prospect of health outcomes tied to where you go to school? I mean, I think it's a conversation. Um, I think it's more of a parent's concern than a student's concern. I don't think the students are looking at it uh, as holistically. Not not, not a, the majority of them are looking at it as holistically as like a parent would look at, you know, those type of things as an outcome. You know, you may be in, in a group of 100 students, maybe 20 of them are plugged into the way of looking at something like, um, I don't know, I don't know, again, the extent that they would really be investigating that. I think it's an interesting talking point as an adult, you know, to have that conversation with with a young person about those things um, and things for them to think about in regard to long term health or long term wealth and those kind of things and um, what it looks like. But I don't know that it's really at the forefront of a lot of 17, 18 year olds, you know, to, to Jared's point, you know, what am I what am I thinking about at 17 years? Not a lot about my health and, and, and moving in a progressive way with. Um, you know what the school is doing for me in that long term. So I don't I don't know that it's a large talking point for the majority of young people. Um, but like I said, maybe their parents would be interested to know that and if how much it sways them being comfortable with them making decisions about certain schools based on the long term effects, what they believe to be long term effects of them going to a particular institution. See that, that that and that's my point. Like, I I, I I totally feel Eric's point on this. Like, like Fred is right about the, the 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 notion of you don't have that kind of stress, and that's unhealthy stress on your mind and your body. Brother KD is right when he says like you have better health care when you get out. So obviously, if you're going to take a survey when you're out of school and you're reporting how healthy you are now, that's a major factor that we're tying to kind of a secondary factor about where you went to school. It's just hard for me to get past I, knowing how much smokos I ate when I was at, at Morgan, <laughs> and how much how much Mad Dog I was drinking at Morgan. <laughs> I mean, so and you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's why it's important. <laughs> hold on, <laughs> but that's why it's important that we know who was surveyed because that thirty one percent could literally be the athletes. Listen, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Literally. You make a very valid point. It might be the fact that during those formative years, you try something that is so damaging to your liver and kidneys that your body learns how to recover. It's like when you was a kid and you got like, like you, you like, like hit your knee on the ground and you know, you got some bacteria in it. So you, you know, you build up immunity. immunity to, wow. Immunity. 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 It's the same basic situation. It's just like, you know, you, you get to a place that your body is just kind of Teflon. Think about it. Most of us, we went to college, and this may be off the cuff, but a lot of us drank liquor. On some other campuses, beer is the thing. 
They right. just don't get your liver the same way. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. I will say. We drank both at fam. Yeah, right. We drank both. Because <laughs> before I was, we were drinking Marine, everything in Florida and them. Everything. <laughs> before I was a Marine, I didn't drink beer. After I became a Marine, I started drinking beer at an alarming rate. <laughs> it's different. It's different. It's definitely a different drink. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a different drink. <laughs> it's a different. It's a different experience. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm interested to talk to the to to the the lady tomorrow. And I hate that we're killing her research like this, by the way. Shout out um, to her for doing it. Yeah, and 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 I'm and I'm I'm interested to see what what were the what were the foundations to say let's talk about the 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 health outcomes for HBC students versus not. Because obviously this is a report that was that probably was designed to fit a hypothesis of black students do better at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And the head, research, the head research of this project is white, so I, that though that that's something for y'all to consider. But you won't wait to the end of the day. I'm just saying it wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't done from a perspective of let's take an HBCU graduate, pose a hypothesis, and then try to manipulate data to fit that hypothesis. I don't think that I don't think that you're talking about a person who had who had a horse in the race per se. Right. Like people, here's the thing. Here's the thing about. He was like, was it, was it a black doctor? Was it a white doctor or a witch doctor? A black, a, a black, a black alum wouldn't do this because we know. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that we already believe. <laughs> so we know take, that we're valuable. <laughs> we don't do research because it's stuff we already know. We know. We yeah. are, we're gonna take, we're gonna take another quick break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about big news out of Nashville, uh, Tennessee State, and Meharry partnering for a medical uh, and healthcare professional pipeline between the two institutions. That just at the dark. We'll be right back. <laughs> that just at the dark. And we're back uh, trying to discover the, the PG County Baltimore pipeline. Um, now let's talk about a new pipeline in Nashville between Tennessee State University and Meharry uh, Medical School. Uh, this will be a new initiative that will uh, support students or undergraduates from TSU that is uh, looking to careers in medical science and healthcare uh, to to have a more direct access point to Meharry Meharry Medical College, uh, which is one of the top medical schools for African Americans in the country. Uh, one of three uh, with them and the Morehouse School of Medicine and what is it, Charles Drew? Okay. No play. Do not do that. <laughs> do not do that. Howard School of Medicine. Do not do that. Give you Charles Drew some love. People who don't understand. The presidential. Yes, Charles R. Drew is not. <laughs> not. <laughs> not. <laughs> NHBCU Medical School. Thank you very much. It is sometimes a predominantly oh, black institution. Okay. <laughs> She real mad. You mean the Howard University College of Medicine? That's what you meant. Um. Anyway, so what do you guys think about this? The, the question is not the obvious. Is it a good thing? Obviously, it's a good thing. Um. It it would stand to benefit both schools because you would imagine that you would have a certain sector of undergraduates that would go to Tennessee State just for the opportunity to get a shot at Meharry. But I guess my larger question is this, and we've talked about this before. How come we don't see? a lot more HBCUs do this between baccalaureate programs and master's programs. Um, I, I wish I had an answer. Um, I really don't. I have an answer. Okay, go ahead. Ego. Is that it? Is what's, oh, yes. Ego is what um, prevents people from collaborating in the way that makes the, the mm. most sense. For their campus. If you know you can't get your own, um, establish your own uh, doctoral programs or master's programs, but you have a school that's right on the street that shares the same mission as, as yours, and you don't think about going into a partnership with them, that's a problem. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be looking at the collective of our of our institutions as separate things and body. We should be working together always. This is a marketplace. Um, I'm going to agree with you, Tiff, but I don't just want to know if your ego is on the side you think it is. Because that's... that's. I didn't say what side it was on. No, I'm, I'm, no, I'm saying that perspective a lot of times 
We don't talk about the schools that actively in their administration look down upon schools that are close to them and therefore make it harder for people who may have went to school there. Therefore making it harder for people who may want to eventually go there for grad school. A lot of a lot of like, you have to deal with it. Like there, there should not be, and I've said this before on other podcasts, there should not be any individual who makes you feel like they ruined your experience. I get it, things happen, but there's no individual that's bigger than our, our, our institution. There is no individual. Oh, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about I'm talking about literally like relationships between leadership and schools because let's not act like there is an internalized hierarchy of how we perceive some schools to us. So but what again, I'm saying, people who are who who put themselves in an inferior um position where they don't want to take you up on an offer, what do you say then? Because I know it's happened. What do you say? I'm sure it's happened. Let's talk about the let's talk about the academic logistics of this because there are a lot of HBCUs. Let's Let's be clear and honest up front. There are a lot of HBCUs that have partnerships. Some of them don't hear a lot about. Wiley has a partnership with Texas Southern in terms of criminal justice. That 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 exists. There are partnerships between um, Howard, Howard and Moore, which you don't hear a lot about. There are partnerships between a lot of HBCUs and PWIs you occasionally hear some about. So these things exist, um, but they're not they're not put out there as a major marketing point as a career pathway. And that's what I think that we're missing. Bennett has a partnership with A&T. They have dual enrollment. A lot My of people don't know that. And, and, and it would stand to reason, and I'll throw this to you, uh, to, um, Winston, if you knew or if it was more readily known that if I go to Bennett and graduate, I probably have a great shot at getting into graduate school at A&T, wouldn't that have been Bennett? in a powerful way for a high school kid and their parents to see. If my daughter goes to Bennett, she'll probably slide right on into a, mass, a master's program, a competitive master's program at AT. That seems to be like a, a reasonable reason to say, yeah, we're going to send our daughter there and we're going to pay that bill because that's a good pathway. Bennett and AT degrees. Absolutely. I think that I think that's a conversation. I think we've had a couple of young ladies, even with the com the Spellman and Cat uh, connection, who specifically targeted that to be able to take advantage of it. So I know it's a thing, especially when you live in a state where, where again, we don't have HBCU. So if you're going to get, you know, bang for your buck, so to speak, you know, they're going to they want to know about any collaboration programs. If it leads to if it's undergrad related, if it's you know graduate school or further, you know, that's always a conversation piece for you know, for a parent who's exploring that option for a young person, you know, coming from Michigan and, and for dealing with us in our program. So I think it has to be more of a conversation. I don't know why it's not, you know, I literally, I try to search around for those things. And one of our young ladies who will, did take advantage of the opportunity between Spelman and, and NCAT, you know, that was one of the reasons why she went is from, from discovering it being in our program. And, you know, it's, it's work to be able to look for those opportunities for the young people. And, you know, fortunately, we're in a position to be able to do some of that legwork to find it. But a lot of young people don't have a resource like that to know what's out there and know what's available to them. And it has to be more of a conversation about HBCUs exploring them and then us being aware of them, which I think is an overarching issue in the in the in the sector about people not knowing what's available. You know, that's a, that's an issue across the in a lot of different ways in the way HBC uses what you don't know is there. If you're not in the circle, if you're not in the know, you don't know what, what's available to you. And that's part of the issue, part of the problem. Do you think it's a question, KD, that, that some HBCUs don't want to promote other HBCUs, even in the realm of a partnership? I don't believe so. I think some of it, like Winston said, is just lack of knowledge and lack of um, lack of understanding of how powerful that of a recruiting tool it is. And some of it is our leadership just changes too much for mm -hmm. us to have established relationships across the board. Because I, I look at Coppin and Morgan and the way we participate in the University of Maryland system, even though Morgan doesn't do that specifically, mm -hmm. there's still classes I could have taken um, at Morgan while being at Coppin because mm -hmm. they still have to follow a certain set of rules in order for their degree to count, if you will, in order for the classes to count towards your degree, if you will. So it's, it's one of those things where I would ask, one, where is our leadership in this, um, saying, hey, this is a good idea. Then, two, how does that fit the state systems? 
right? <clears throat> what do the states require <laughs> for these programs? And then how can we use the, marry those two things together so that we have a more fluid and more functioning network amongst our schools? Because it's a good idea. I mean, you know, I, I wish schools like Coppin did more of that, especially because now we have the space to take on more students. Um, <clears throat> so that will help us keep that building open, essentially, if we mm -hmm. could just get tuition from a couple other places besides relying on our own recruiting. And then that would do a lot of the recruiting for us too, right? Because if a UB student comes to a, um, a cop in class and likes what they likes what they see, they might just transfer. Right. You know, so it's stuff like that. I just it's a leadership thing though. We need some continuity and leadership so we can build these relationships. Um, and hopefully we see that more in the future as we have to we have to get more creative about enrollment because of the pandemic. Do you think that or is that it would put extra pressure on the, I guess, the starting point HBCU? So, for example, Texas Southern has a law school. And if you said, OK, well, if you go to Prairie View and you want to major in political science or you want to major in any um, undergraduate program that has a pathway to law, whether that would be English or, you know, something like public policy or something like that, that Prairie View still has to do the legwork of that recruitment. And therefore, they say, well, maybe we ought we, we shouldn't do that because in a way that puts more money into, you know, pre, uh, Texas Southern's coffers. And we have graduate programs over here. Maybe not we don't have law, but maybe we're better suited promoting some of our graduate programs. Do you think that it's a logistical question or a business decision where one institution may say that sounds good, but it doesn't it doesn't readily seem like beneficial to us? Is that would that be a concern for an institution? I would say yes. And one thing we have to keep in mind as well, and I was talking about it the other day, like obviously Texas Southern has a really good law school. So does Howard. Um, you know, those are two really, really prominent, important law schools in their area. And same with the medical schools, um, especially a school like Howard and, and Meharry. But the problem is that they're trying to recruit mm -hmm. for the best students. And graduate school is a different animal. So having a partnership is cool for programs that don't have those meticulous standards. So your business schools that are AAC, AAC is be accredited, your law schools, your medical schools, they have to get the best students. And in some cases, I mean, if you look, even if you look at, um, at, at, at TMCF this year with the Hennessy Fellows, a lot of those Howard Law students, the UDC Law, I mean, some of those guys, people, people are not HBCU undergraduates. One guy went to University of Texas and then went to Howard Law School. So in some cases, is he taking a spot of another HBCU undergraduate alumni? He maybe, maybe had better grades, maybe he had better grades, maybe he interviewed better. I don't know. But I think that with these highly competitive programs, like um, medical, like um, – Law and even business, obviously Morgan, Howard, a couple other schools have really strong, high rated business schools. They're looking for the best candidates, period. They would prefer them to be black, even better their HBCU undergraduate graduates. But a lot of those spots at TSU's law school, at Howard's law school, are not taken up by HBCU undergrad. I mean, the girl who wrote the piece about Howard spending the money from, from, you know, from Netflix you know, on athletics went to UVA. Now, again, that, does that take the spot of a kid from Morgan, a kid from A&T, a kid from somewhere else? It might. The same thing with the black kids who go to NCCU's law school because they could, maybe, could maybe they didn't get into UNC's law, but they go to NCCU. Is that taking a spot from somebody from A&T? I, I, I would say so. So these partnerships are important, but I think we can't undermine, like you said, logistically that – the school with the money asset, with the law school, with the medical school, does not have the same interest as the school without it. So mm -hmm. the school without it has an interest of getting their kids into those higher level programs. The school with the money is trying to find the best graduates. And in, mo and in many cases, they end up taking on more black students or just or maybe proportional black students from PWIs, especially because those black students getting into subsequent PWI law schools, subsequent PWI medical schools is way harder than getting into undergrad. Mm. Mm. That's a good point. I mean, and, and I think that there is a, there is a conversation to be had about 
these the the nature of selectivity at the undergraduate level and the level of preparation that you need to get into a lot of our HBCU graduate programs. <clears throat> um, because I can tell you, I, I was a decent student coming out of Morgan. Um, I applied for uh, I, 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 undergraduate. I applied for the um, the Masters of uh, African American Studies at Morgan. Couldn't get in, not because the grades weren't good. I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough courses in history to qualify for that program. So it is true. We're not just, we're not just letting you're not just letting anybody in just because you want to go. Like you have to meet a certain standard, not just with your test scores, but with your training at the undergraduate level. And it could be that a lot for these these graduate programs, which are really really good. A lot of people don't don't give a lot of credit to the HBCU graduate programs. This ain't the undergraduate show. Um, they're really, really rigorous and really, really selective. So that that is a good thing. But I think that oh, go ahead, go ahead, Wes. You I was gonna say I think we got to play the string too. Like you know, works like you look at Xavier, Louisiana. Like that's a great. It should be of several pipelines from Xavier, Louisiana, for medical school. You know, in Morgan, talking about Morgan's business school. I think we got to like just similarly how donations seem to go to those institutions that are well known in the sectors. It needs to be the same thing with the partnership. You got to start playing up what we know well. Those schools should automatically be you know, searching for those partnership opportunities. And then the other schools can see what, oh, there's value in investing in having a student prepared for medical school. There's I've heard, I venture to say value this. in having a student who's ready for a good MBA program and we and ways that we can invest in them in those things. Go ahead, Brett. I venture to say this. If we did more partnerships, it would possibly stop a lot of schools from wasting money on programs they shouldn't be running in the first place. Hmm. That, that's a good point. That's one that, point. That's also to KD's point about the leadership because yeah, that would be continuous continuous and focus on those programs. Yeah, it, like, and this is going to sound messed up, but like, and I could say it on both ends. There are some, there are some HBCUs that have grad school programs they should not be running, and you have some HBCUs that have undergraduate programs they don't even have the capacity to run. Definitely undergraduate for sure, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at it from that situation, like, like I'm. I'm sorry, like I, you, you probably don't need to be. If you go offer sociology in, in this, in this, in this aspect, and you got three PhDs in your entire department, and you got them same three PhDs teaching all the courses at the grad school, grad school level, you might keep your undergraduate program, but cut that grad program and go to the school down the street that actually got the capacity to do it. Like at some point, there's a lot of issues that came around that that, and this kind of goes back to ego too, but not in the exact same way where it's like. If you're knowing your strength, if you if you can look at your school and be like, you know what, these are our heavy hitters. This is what we do really well. And there's an HBCU down the street that they do this better. We ain't making no money off of it. We're not benefiting our students off of it because they can't get to a particular level in their career. Why don't we? Why don't we fo like focus our efforts in what we do best, and then build a partnership in an area that that school down the street doesn't do best. But, but, but Eric, but Eric, one thing I'll say is this, right? And we can, I'll talk about Morgan and Coppin. Coppin has traditionally had an amazing nursing program, right? Hey, one, one best in the state. Might be the best, best in the region. State. Do you know who, do you know who number two is now? It's Morgan. Do you know who's grown enrollment faster than Coppin in the last 10 years Morgan. in nursing? It's Morgan. Morgan. And, and again, I don't, I don't say that with pride. It's cannibalized. It's cannibalized Coppin's program. Mm -hmm. And and I think that we have to keep in mind that a lot these presidents are not beholden to the community. They're beholden to their school. Right. And mm -hmm. what's in the best interest of Morgan is not always in the best interest of Coppin. And, and mm -hmm. again, it would it probably would be smarter to have a partnership there than Morgan produce its own nursing program. But what they what, what they did instead was produce their own program. And now I, I guarantee you the next 10 years, Morgan's program will probably be more known than Coppin's. Not because it's any better, but because Morgan's a school with a higher profile, more enrollment and more students. And I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big issue that we have within our sector is that schools with a bigger cachet have the ability to duplicate programs from HBCU, just like the PWIs did. Yeah. And then it usurps that money out. So Th th that's why I think Morgan Cop is a prime example of there's nothing that you can do at Coppin that's unique that you can't do at Morgan now because Morgan mm -hmm. continues to do those programs. But let's let's put a fine pin on it before we before we round out the conversation. When we talk about these pipelines, regardless of the school, 
you ain't talking about 20 students that are going from an undergraduate program to a graduate program from one institution. You may be talking about one or two because a program like a, a school like Meharry or Howard or Morehouse School of Medicine, you're talking about an incoming class of, of potential PhDs that might be 15 students right? Yeah. From, from worldwide, worldwide. Like that's that of the of the all the, the let's say three to five hundred applicants that, that go for any cohort that meet the requirements, they're gonna let in about 15 to 20. Right. So if you say we have a pipeline, you're talking about two students any given year. However, and to the opposite point, those two students every year, that adds up a lot. And that gives you an opportunity for that undergraduate program to market to, to high achieving students out of high school and say, hey, if you come to Tennessee State and you keep your grades up, you'll probably be on the fast track to go to my area and get a doctorate. Yeah. So there's numbers and then there's culture and then there's capacity and then there's readiness for the from the students perspective. And I think that if anything that we take away from this conversation is that the two institutions or, or two institution types got to do a much better job of saying, let's work together to make sure that we can we can recruit the top students and get something going where they go from here to here to here to there and be successful. Let's take one more quick break and we're going to round out the conversation. Um, more money for elite HBCUs. How big news at Howard. Uh, but despite Tiffany, we're going to talk about a big gift to uh, Prairie View A&M. Dodgers at the dark. We'll That's right. fine. <laughs> Uh, right, right, right. After dark, and we're back. Uh, Tiffany harassing undergraduates on her timeline. Um, oh, I don't remember basic that. civics lessons. Um, but now, just to wrap up the conversation for tonight, another big gift uh, came to the HBCU community uh, this week an anonymous $10 million gift to Prairie View AM University. And I believe oh. that this is the second time this year that Prairie View has collected the, the, the biggest gift in school history. So a, couple, a few months ago, Prairie View got a gift and I think maybe eight. And now this surpassed. Um, so I'm just going to ask the question. Um, what happened to that whole conversation about why does Howard Morales and Spelman get all the money? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It we didn't go anywhere. Senator. She was president of Brown. She ain't a regular public <laughs> president. Hold up. So you know how to get money. Let me, let me be very clear. She was the president of Brown. She's an HBCU alumna. She's an HBCU faculty member. She was the provost at Spelman. So she got a, she got a, she got a. Schools to get money. She, so went, she, went, she went to Diller <laughs> and worked at Spelman. Schools to get money. Right. You said the quiet part out loud. She has a network. Yeah. She she does. Does. She does. That's what we established two months ago when this started. Dr. Happening. Simmons is not, is not the system Normal. that came up in the PWI in the PWI universe and decided to end her career at HBCU. That's the quiet part. She you gotta build relationships. The HBCU community. She stepped out. Get the Peloton bike so Peloton bike so I mean you realize that like she has she has she has touched hands that most HBCU presidents have not had a chance to because she was a president. She wasn't a she wasn't even a provost about she was a president of an Ivy League institution in Providence, Rhode Island. She, she has a certain level of access, one. And two, she is in a really, really interesting position because Prairie View is the predominant HBCU in Texas mm -hmm. by far. It's the oldest, it's the predominant. I mean, I'm wearing a TSU shirt, but it's, it is what it is. And thirdly, she's from Texas. Right. So her, her network in the state with legislatures with people in the business community and then just elite money in this country is, is un unprecedented. She's probably the most connected HBCU president only behind probably probably the, the young man at uh, at A&T. I thought you were going to say the young man at Morgan and I was going to boot you right out. I was about to say that. <laughs> 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 hey, no, I'm saying, okay, okay and, that, and all of that is fair. Yeah, all of that is fair. And, and, and Dr. Simmons' career bears that out. And I recently had a conversation, my very first one with her. And she said, if I don't do anything else but raise money and try to improve outcomes at Prairie View, I've done my job. I'm only here for a little bit um, because I was retired before I got here. So I'm here uh, because I want to be here and I'm here to achieve a certain level of objectives so that I, everything you're saying is well taken. I'm just saying, like, we keep trying to, to, to specifically speak to the young people, I think, through this show who keep putting out this misnomer. That the only HBCUs that get money 
or Howard Morehouse and Spellman. And over the course of this show, I think every opportunity that we 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 could take, we have tried to take to say Prairie View getting money, Fort Valley State getting money. Um, it's a whole bunch of HBCUs out here getting money. Now, are they getting a hundred million dollars? No, but they are getting money. They're not getting one hundred dollars or two hundred dollars to pass go either. You know right. what I mean? Like they're getting substantive gifts. Tougaloo just got four million dollars. Like at mm -hmm. some point, like this, this narrative has to stop because I think that it's dangerous to keep yeah. saying that. And everybody who's on the outside interested in giving to HBCUs is saying, "Well, if I'm gonna be criticized for giving, I'm not gonna do it." Yeah, and not just that. Again, let me challenge these dummies. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you won't use the word <laughs> dummy Baltimore. from Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> but yo, like the other thing that really pisses me off is that half of them that are saying this don't even give a dime to their HBCU. That's a fact. They probably, probably have some more, disdain dude. towards their HBCU over financial aid. Like seriously, <laughs> like fam, at some point, check into the game, join your alumni association, throw some money, start raising money for your school. Or, or I don't like this up. t shirt, okay? Nobody care about your t-shirts. No, you if you ain't, if you look, the least anybody can do is buy a licensed t-shirt crew neck. No, for real, for real. I bought a flag. I got t-shirts. I got sweatshirts. Like I like. I mean, I I, you're not seeing it today because I'm back on the bricks. But um, <laughs> I wanted to be outside. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a fan of Cobb State University as an alum, so I'm right, going to right. represent my university everywhere I go. If you're not doing that. You don't have a conversation with me about schools receiving money because it's it's fruitless at best. But even even if we're not talking about giving money, because a lot of that is we're just talking about big time multi million dollar gifts, right? Mm -hmm. That usually come from one person or a corporation. Southern got you know a couple million from Dow and Chevron that went under the radar. Yeah. But we're also not talking about schools like North Carolina Central where you had their alumni under the age of 40, give a couple million dollars. You're not talking about a Shaw University that had alumni given $900,000 at a gala a couple years ago. Like HBCUs are starting to get that kind of engagement. They're starting to get the kind of gifts um, that, you know, while, while in comparison to higher education, we're still catching up there, but we're doing a lot better than we used to. You're not talking about a, a gala where you know they pass the plate around and the final total is maybe you know fifty thousand dollars. I'm a, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars being raised in a single night at this point. I'm a so double. Down. I think alumni and I think HBCU sectors they're not we're not doing well. We're not obviously not overrunning with money, but we we we're not we're not trash either. And I, and I wish we we would stop promoting that. Hey, look, I'll double down on it. If and when that debt get erased in January mm. by the administration. I don't want to hear nothing from nobody talking about they can't donate to their HBCU because you got a big ass bag. Like some of y'all, some of y'all, some of y'all been complaining about about student loan payments they that you made in seven months, <laughs> forever, forever, or forever, and you talking about. Oh, I can't donate, or I don't owe my school anything. You use your degree every day. That's what I'm saying. Particularly so like, if you would have graduated. See what happens then, because then what's the excuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. No doubt. Absolutely. No doubt. I, I think. What do you think? Well, let me ask you this. I always like to ask the question: Whose responsibility is it? Is it the school's responsibility? Because they're obviously sharing the news about money that they get, mm -hmm. so they're doing what they can do to let people know. Hey, we got a big gift. Hey, we got a partnership. Hey, we got a friend in, in such and such from people you've never heard of, right? Like the, the Tougaloo gift, these are two people I've never heard of. These were a, a, an astronomer out in Boston somewhere, gave him $4 million. So you, you, they got friends in high places that you never, that you, you, you never heard of and they're promoting that. But yet, I, I don't know. Is it? Is it? I don't know what the digest can do. I don't know what we can do as advocates. I don't know what can be done where people can stop can stop the madness of we don't we we're only three brother, schools are getting every the best of everybody. Brother, this is the same social media. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, wait. Never mind. Oh, wait. <laughs> we just got through a presidential cycle where people believe that President Biden is a pedophile. 
<laughs> I, I, I just so you said this is QAnon's fault. Is QAnon is spreading? Mm-hmm. And the QAnon, the people that would lean on QAnon as factual information, like they believe PizzaGate, dog. QAnon is saying QAnon is saying that Asia Howard Moore is spelling. It's it's just the same. I'm not saying it's the same exact people, but I'm saying that when that type of information is being believed and being repeated and being shared, it's it is it's really tough. tough to get through the good factual information in this era. Right. Yeah. You, they are very because people don't even believe in journalism anymore. Right. Right. People believe people readily lean on blog spaces than actual journalists. People Wait don't even understand the research that goes into journalism anymore. Wait a minute. <laughs> 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 Be nice, brother. <laughs> I did that. I did that. <sighs> That's all I'm saying. Is that, you know. is that it's hard uh, to get good news through because people think that every people distrust regular journalism. So you know, I I I'm not putting any stock into these complaints, and especially from people who ain't giving no money. You bring up an interesting point about the journalism because another thing is that a lot of these local papers are are blowing this stuff up. Um, we don't read them. Um, Fort Valley, a lot of these new <laughs> local new, Atlanta Journal Constitution, a large newspaper, fact, they're blowing this stuff up. There's a generation of children that believe that you don't have to pay for news. Yes. Literally, they will not no, pay yeah. for a single publication. Yeah. I used to, as a high school student, I used to get the Sun paper outside the bus on the right. way to school and walk around with the paper and right. read the news. These kids don't do that. They think all no. the information come on their phone for free. That that yep. is that's a larger part. If it ain't on the shade room, it wasn't news. So All right, the PG the the So it's the problem. Like, just, people do don't you respect the shade room. Do I follow the shade room? Yep. No. Yes, you do. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what I got a lot for? And what I got a lot of you no, for? She follow. She follow HBCU Buzz though. No, I don't. <laughs> 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 Yo, that's the first time I've heard a diss tra- a diss record on a podcast. <laughs> flex bomb, flex bomb, flex bomb. <laughs> oh my god. All right, we go on that note. We're gonna go ahead and write I know y'all missed oh, wait, wait, wait. On that note, I got a rhetorical question. I know y'all Donald, is Donald Trump the Morris Brown or President? President, oh, president. Oh, is Morris Brown the Donald Trump or President right. Trump? Oh, oh, I just had to ask. Oh, oh, I just had to ask. Is busy. The devil is busy. The devil is busy. The devil is busy. Good night, HBCU fan. Oh, oh, yeah, we, we, we thank we you, everybody, you everybody for listening. Yeah, just have to talk. Uh, thank you for <laughs> this show without any mention of Kevin James and Morris Brown College, but Eric. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that energy had to go, had to come back. It's been too long, Tiff. <laughs> it's been too long. Oh my God. We thank you for listening. Uh, we will catch you next week. Peace. <laughs>